So determining the origin of chest pain is going to be one of the biggest conundrums you're going to have in your finals. And it's so common, it is almost, I say almost because it probably won't <laughs> if it jinx you, but if um, if you think about it, in terms of all the things that are going to come up in your finals, chest pain is a pretty good one to revise and have a very thorough approach for looking at it. So chest pain, the first thing you're going to do is ask yourself about the A, B, C, D, E of emergency management of something. So is this patient talking to you? Is their work of breathing very high? Um, circulatory disposition have you got your blood pressure and your heart rate attached as monitor and by extension have you got their sats monitor and have you looked at their capillary refill time feeling are they cold clapped out clammy etc do they need an iv cannula at this stage and then don't ever forget glucose to make sure you're going to check a bm and overall, does this situation dictate the need to apply oxygen? And don't forget, in oxygen, uh, in emergency situation oxygen, this is at 15 litres per minute via a non, a non rebreathe mask. There's more on emergency assessments in other videos. So moving on to chest pain itself. Of course, we're going to use the thing you've been taught since year one in medical school, which is your Socrates model of looking at chest pain. And this stands for site, where's the pain, or on the maximal side of pain, onset, when did it start, was it sudden, gradual, and is it progressive or regressive in onset, the character, what's the pain like, is it achy, is it stabby, does it go through to the back, that's where you're going to look in radiation in the R, does the pain radiate anywhere, does it move through to the back particularly, does it go down the arm, the left arm, does it go into the jaw associations are there any other signs of symptoms associated with the pain is a reflux associated with the pain are you burping lots belching lots the time course of the pain does the pain follow any pattern exacerbating or relieving factors does anything change the pain lying up sitting down etc the severity of the pain how bad is the pain and whenever you're trying to ask these questions you're essentially trying to discern whether anything relates back to the heart. I mean, whenever we say relates back to the heart, it means does it involve the heart, any of its vessels or anything attached to the heart. Now, considering, considering as your whole body is attached to the heart, um, sometimes that makes a very broad catch. But in fairness, uh, the biggest thing that you're trying to show is that you're identifying any of the major causes of chest pain that are concerning that will lead the patient um, to die or come to harm. So from your ABCDE assessment, you've got a lot of things attached to the patient monitor-wise, but look at their JVP. Look at their JVP in the neck. Is it bounding? Are there signs of heart failure with having bilaterally, um, bilateral sounds on, on chest auscultation? You know, has the patient a third heart sound? These are all things you should be saying. So I wonder if they bilateral pulmonary edema, are there any crackles in the chest and the bases of the chest? Is there JVP bounding? Is there a third heart sound? Because you need to be querying other signs of heart failure. And of course, failure can be acute or chronic. You can have acute pulmonary edema from an acute cardiac event, but you can also have a chronic element of heart failure as well, so a worsening heart failure, and that can be led by um, an ischemic heart, coronary vessels, such as angina, worsening heart failure from structural changes in the heart, or a flash pulmonary edema, for example. should also consider whether this person is likely to have a PE. And a PE should predominate your um, diagnosis, your investigations of diagnosis in quite a lot of ways because you should be checking if there's an obstructive signs here. Um, are they at risk of DVT? Are they long lies? Are they elderly? Are they bed bound? Uh, weight issues? Um, have they tender calves? Look at the sizes of the calves, red calves, painful calves, um, shortness of breath, increased work of breathing without other chest signs should really point you towards um, you know, considering a pulmonary embolus or, or or even considering DVT leading to pulmonary embolus and investigating that appropriately. You may then want to discuss D-dimer tests, um, Wells criteria and a CTPA for these patients. Along those lines, there are diagnoses you don't want to miss, such as chest sepsis. So if you've got somebody you consider who might be septic, and what we consider as being septic is, is having an increased temperature with fever, they might have bronchial breathing, so an increased work of breathing and bronchial breathing. They may also have an increased work of breathing, increased heart rate, and whenever you suspect this, 
this is obviously in the absence of any um, laboratory investigations, um, but if you could do point of care testing, for example, for, for CRP or white cells or anything like that, uh, you might want to consider the sepsis. So if you ever suspect that somebody's got sepsis, you mention the sepsis 6. The next thing you're going to start considering is, is this, has this person any coronary disease? And how you're going to ask about that uh, or investigate that is consider did they have increased age? Have they increased BMI? Do they smoke? Do they drink? So these are all risk factors for coronary disease. And do they have signs of increased lipids, such as um, the deposits around their eyes, in the tendons, uh, signs of nicotine, well, it's tar-stained fingers, for example, increased BMI, increased age. Uh, and you're really starting to consider here whether this person might have a metabolic issue. So metabolic issue is highlighted uh, whenever the patient appears to be hypertensive with type 2 diabetes um, and increased abdominal girth. And that's your, your nasty metabolic triad that makes, every, that makes all the badness more likely. Then you're going to move on to vascular. And vascular really looks at investigating pulses. And whenever we talk about pulses in this context of chest pain um, and vascular badness in general, you're talking particularly about the carotids and femorals. You're going to check all pulses um, ultimately, but you're going to check the carotids and femorals and see if there's any bruise over them, turbulent flow over a vessel. So by bringing all these elements and having looked investigative for PA, failure, sepsis, coronary issues and vascular issues, this is even just in your initial assessment of somebody, you have started to ask the question as to whether this is cardiac in nature and you will have gone some way as to including or excluding cardiac causes. But as as we said at the start, the first thing you're going to need to ask yourself is, is the person stable? And by that we mean hemodynamically stable, are their pulses okay, are they hyperdynamic circulation, hypovolemic, well, you know, what are the cause of that? And whenever you whenever you think this question, are they stable? you know, instigate A, B, C, D, E early on and then move on to Socrates. So signposting that you're a safe practitioner by saying I would appreciate the A, B, C, Ds in this scenario, assessing whether patients hemodynamically stable or about to go into a circulatory collapse and potentially arrest. Is this patient peri-arrest? Once you've assessed that, it's then safe enough to go on um, after applying oxygen and any other immediate therapies you might need to do to consider things like sepsis and the sepsis 6 to assess whether they're in heart failure to assess whether there's vascular problems, coronary problems, and things like that. But a really important thing uh, that you should get from the coronary section over here is to not forget to talk about risk factors. So whenever the examiner is asking you about chest pain, you might want to say, I'm concerned about some of the risk factors this patient might have for coronary disease, such as an increasing age, an increasing BMI. They smoke, they drink lots of alcohol, they have signs of hyperlipidemia, and they might have um, that triad of hypertension, increased abdominal girth, and type 2 diabetes, leading to a pretty dodgy metabolic syndrome that can profoundly affect uh, the person that makes them more likely to have um, to have cardiovascular illness. So our next video is going to look at what all of these components might mean. Of course, you're going to request an ECG, you're going to request bloods, you're going to request investigations. But this this video is really important to highlight that all of these things come together to start to ask the question: But is this cardiac disease? And actually, goes to show there's a there's quite a lot um, of information you need to look at before you even start asking for those adjunct investigations. If you like these sort of videos, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon, leave some notes in the comments, let me know how you're getting on, what content you'd like to see. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.